times. And if you'd like to find out more about Dave, you can visit our website. And here's Dave. Okay. That reminds me of a show. Here's Johnny, but we won't do that today. Okay, so the first question we want to ask, and let me get myself set up here, is what is a copyright? A copyright is a, is a figment of Congress's imagination. Uh, they decided that there should be some arbitrary rights. They decided philosophically that those rights should be protected. As a matter of fact, those rights are constitutional. They're works of, not of art. Art is, is not, it's just the opposite. But they're science. So if you go to the preamble of the Constitution, you will find arts and sciences, and you now know that copyright falls under science, not art, for whatever that's worth. Anyhow, what copyright is, is it's a bundle of six different rights, as it shows on the screen. Uh, it's based on, on your principle that you had when you went to school, that you, you didn't plagiarize somebody else's work. You didn't look over the, uh, over the shoulder of somebody. I'm not saying you did or didn't, but supposedly you didn't look over your shoulder of anybody. And... Um, uh, cheat. And so this, what copyright rights do is they keep you from plagiarizing somebody else's work. We're going to cover in a little while uh, when is it a copyrightable work, and we will come back to uh, in a little while um, to define derivative works, works and, but let's briefly go through the various works that we have. There's a bundle of six rights. One is the right to reproduce. That means copy. The next one is to make a derivative work. That's to add something or subtract something from the work that was already copyrighted. There's distribute copies. That means, okay, the ones I made by reproduction, I now can send out to the rest of the world. You have the right to distribute copy. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I did that one. You have the right to publicly display a work, to publicly perform the work, and to perform via digital audio transmission the work, like television shows. Anyhow, those are your six copyright rights. Uh, they're fundamental. Uh, everything you do when you say, I have a copyright and you're infringing it, uh, basically boils down to um, what can you copyright? Whoop. One second. Okay. What you can copyright is defined by statute, and the statute says that what you can copyright is the original work of an authorship. Now, those are important words. Every little word means something uh, to somebody in, in law. And original works, the word original means something. It means there has to be some creativity required. Now, what can't be, be done? If it, it, well, if it's not creative. For example, it's pretty hard to say what would be creative with a phone book. So a phone book is not copyrightable. At least the white pages are not copyrightable. Um, ideas may not be copyrighted because it's not, this is not the patent, and we'll distinguish that right at the, at the tail end of this conference. But it's, it's not the tangible media, it's not make, use, and sell. Those aren't protected in copyright. What's protected in copyright are those six work rights we just went over one of which was to reproduce, to, to make more copies. Okay. Um, some creativity, this is the other thing, is also required. And we just talked about that a minute ago. 
ideas when they may not be copyrighted. We talked about that. Your version of an idea may be copyrighted. This goes directly into software. If you've got 10 different uh, ways of expressing your code, then you may be able to get a copyright on one of those expressions, not on all 10. The objective, again, is not to give you some sort of monopoly power uh, over mm -hmm. hardware, software, things of that sort, um, but to give you instead the right to prevent others from reproducing your product by copying. So I may be able to, I may be coding and I may independently code and by accident fall on somebody else's copyrighted work and actually maybe even duplicate it. But if you can't prove there was access to the copyrighted work, if you can't prove what kind of access you had or didn't have, and the fact that you made up your code by yourself, then you have a problem. But if you can show that you prepared your copyrighted work without reference to somebody else's copyrighted work, then you haven't copied. And if you don't copy, you don't become guilty of copyright infringement. Okay, now beyond the fact that it must be original, the other key word is authorship, original works of authorship. So we now know what an original work is. What's an authorship? It means works of literature and text, visual art, dramatic works, musical works, and architecture. Those are the kinds of, of works that an author can produce. So the question then comes, well, who can own a copyrighted work? The first one is easy, the artist or artist, individual artist in a joint work. So you can be an individual artist producing the work, and, and for this one, I'm not, I'm deliberately not using um, software, but I wanted to, to go to something else, which is just, I, I'm, I'm an artist, and I prepare the lyrics on something um, that, that I want to uh, uh, sell as a song later. I have the right, by myself to be the individual artist. Uh, I can have a joint work prepared if, for example, I do the lyrics and I find somebody else who does the music. Now, besides being an ind the artist itself, there's also a contract holder. Any and all your right of your rights can be transferred by contract or will, will meaning testamentary, like when you die. Now, a contract holder has the rights from the artist to do all the six rights or part, a portion of them that we talked about at the very beginning of this discussion. So the question is, what do you do when you, um, have that kind of right. It, it, it's divided into pieces. You have the right for joint work. Usually that's a pre-agreed thing before you really start the work itself. Um, you can transfer the, the rights before uh, you start by an employment relationship or by contract. Now, Things like I commission you to do this work of art may or may not automatically work for be a work for hire. But a work for hire, as I'm going to elaborate when I also elaborate on joint works, a work made for hire is carries really important co concepts of ownership with it. The most important of which is with the work made for hire, the employer becomes the author as well as going beyond being the author and 
being the s and &E. So the holder of a work for hire really has a superior position uh, with regard to ownership of copyright rights. So that brings us to joint works. And for a joint work, each contribution must be intended to be part of a joint work. Even if you did not create them at the time, for mm -hmm. example, as I show here, music created without a lyricist in mind is still a copyrighted work or copyrightable as a work. Um, they must be independently copyrightable as well, which means, remember we said what kind of works can be copyrighted. We haven't talked yet about registration, but we want to know more of what kind of things are we doing with copyrighted works. Um, each piece of the work must be original enough uh, to be subject to copyright in its own. In other words, there's music and there's lyrics. Each one is individually copyrightable. One is uh, a text, and the other is music. Um, but they can be combined together. So those joint works, then, are made between two people who are cooperating and agree with each other in advance. That brings us to using joint works. Each contributor may issue non-exclusive licenses so long as they pay the other contributors their share. Now, you notice payment requirement is important because a copyrighted right is not like a patent right for assignment purposes. A copyrighted right for assignment purposes is um, a necessity. You have a, a duty to let your um, joint war author uh, know what you have obtained in the way of joint rights in the way of money for the joint rights as well. So whereas for patents, which we won't cover today much, um, the assignment, each party has a right to, to capitalize on their assignment by themselves without having to answer to the other parties uh, who may be joint inventors. For joint authors, you have, you have just the reverse duty. You have a duty to report to the other authors what monies you've made and to spell it out with everybody. Um, so anyhow, um, one of the things you can do is everything doesn't have to be black and white. Everything doesn't have to be you own it or you don't own it. As you see from the using joint works, there's the contributor may issue non-exclusive licenses. So a license is a, is a covenant not to sue. That's what really amounts. That's what it really amounts to. And so it's a grant of a right for a period of time between an author or some other owner and some third party. Contributors may not object to any use. However, some licensees may want to obtain permission from all parties. In essence, uh, we're saying that a licensee um, who owns a property right um, can't object to any use of that property right, but the licensee in that ownership may say, before I'll do the license, I want some comfort that I'm obtaining permission from all parties. There aren't any other joint authors that are sitting around. I want to make sure of that before we cut a deal uh, for a license. If you re now, now, what happens if you create a joint work and you refuse your portion of the joint work? You still owe the other contributors their share, even if you are not using their contributions. This is because you are creating a derivative work, 
and we're going to come to derivative works in a couple of minutes. But before that, let's go through works made for hire one more time, because this is an important concept. When is a work considered a work for hire? It's in the scope of employment. So if I sign a contract for employment that has restrictions on my right to own or capitalize on a work for hire, um, that, that will prevail. And the actual author meaning the person who put together the code, for example, that author may have, may end nothing when it's all done, except whatever salary he got or she got. Okay, if, if you sign a contract prior to creating the work, why does it matter that, that you assign the copyright rights or that you uh, have a work for hire? It's because without the work for hire, you have no ownership rights in the work, including rights to the work, which means the employer may have no rights to the work if they don't get an employment agreement with their, with their employee. And by the way, the next, the next uh, session, we'll talk about employment agreements um, and reserving rights to copyright rights in language that you might use in doing that. The, the other thing that you can be without is credit. And if you are known in your field, one of the things you don't want is you don't want other people presuming that some work is or is not uh, creditable to you. You, you need to be careful uh, that you have the right to at least publish the fact that you you made the work, because you may not be the owner of the work or its creator, as we talked about earlier. So now the question comes, after all this stuff, when is the work copyrighted? We've, we've learned about writing agreements uh, for copyrighted works and things like that, but we haven't yet... Um, We haven't yet come to when is the work copyrighted as opposed to copyrightable. Okay, as soon as it's fixed in a tangible medium, like code can be fixed in, in ROM, uh, you own the copyright as soon as you paint, sculpt, write, record something subject to protection. You can also write, as you see on the screen, copyright 2011, your name, it's 2012 actually now. It's just the year, copyright, and then the year of first publication. Your name, or use of the circle with a C symbol, which is uh, a UCC symbol, um, showing that you claim the copyrighted work. Mailing the work to yourself uh, didn't work for patents. It doesn't work for copyrights either. So you can forget that avenue. Um, and it's really not that hard. But let's go through again. Why should I register? And what is registration? So you can't make an infringement claim without a certificate and that means a copyright certificate from the Library of Congress. So you can't make an infringement claim without such a certificate. If someone uses your work and you have registered it properly, you are entitled to statutory damages. Now, well, you're also entitled to actual damages if you can prove it, but if you can't prove that you were actually damaged, you can still claim for statutory damages which are damages prescribed by the statute for you to uh, exploit. Now, an another thing, another reason you would want to register 
is so that you have some notoriety. You can be found in the Library of Congress, and some may, may want to use your work and want to be able to find you. Incidentally, that usually means more money for you. It is the easiest form, copyright is, the easiest form of intellectual property to protect. Compared to patents and trademarks, copyrights are cheap, easy to obtain, and last much longer. Patents are only 20 years from the date of first filing. Trademarks could go on substantially forever, and we're going to come in a few minutes to how long can a copyright last. So first off, let's talk about how do I register. You register by going online at www.copyright.gov. Your filing fees are nominal, 35 50 bucks. You can register more than one work on the same application, as long as they're related. And if you have any doubts as to what you should be doing with registration, you can call a copyright attorney. But normally, for example, what I do in practice is I'll help you fill out your first form, but after your first form, you can do it yourself until you're going to make a change to the work itself and you want to copyright the change, in which you have a derivative work. Um, so you want to go forward on that basis, and um, you, you don't really need to afford a copyright attorney to fill out your form. Just follow the directions on the form as it's presented to you at the Library of Congress, Copyright Office. Okay. Um, next slide, unfortunately, snuck in here, and uh, so I need to make up a reason. What can I include on an application? It was then spelled out in the, the subtitle by what can I include on an application. You can pretty much include anything. It's much better if you give the name of you as the author. It's much better if uh, you say when you first published, uh, is the work a work for hire, is, there, is it a nom de plume, uh, made up work, name for the author. All those things can be included. And when you see an application, uh, You'll, you'll find quickly that it's fairly easy to figure out what to do. Um, it also asks you if you made changes to the application, and if so, uh, to show what, what's been done with it. Okay, so now we finally get to, remember we had 20 years from the date of first filing for patents. Uh, we had virtually perpetual time for trademarks, but for copyrights, it's just a long time. Copyright now lasts the life of the author plus 70 years. Um, thank you, Sonny Bono. Um, he was the one responsible. He was in Congress at the time. Copyrights may be passed down to heirs in a will. We talked about that. A work made for hire lasts 95 years. Now, notice there's a difference between whether you're an author, which is your life, as an author, how many years you live, plus 70 years, there's a difference between that and a work made for hire, which lasts 95 years, but you notice it doesn't say work of an author plus, it's just 95 years. Okay, what about using someone else's work? Now we're finally getting into the infringement area. Um, you can use a work without charge if the work is in the public domain. That, for example, its, it's copyright term has expired. Well, it still exists as a copyright, of, as a work that was copyrighted, but it no longer permits enforcement and it's become public domain. The other way um, you can use it for free 
is if you're using it in a fair use manner, unlike the other kinds of intellectual property rights. Uh, copyright has a fair use exception. It's okay to use in the ways we're talking about. Otherwise, you need permission, and permission comes from getting a license. This is accomplished through a license. The cost of the license may vary based on your use and your relationship with the copyright owner. So you may be able to use uh, 10 of one kind of article and uh, have that as a copyright right and only have to report after you've used it 10 times. Uh, people won't usually do a license that way because it's very difficult to keep up with. So you have now two ways you know of when you can use uh, somebody's work, the public domain or the fair use exception, and if you don't, you know you have to get permission. Your alternative, if you don't get permission, is you lose. You get thin, you get caught for copyright infringement. And as we said before, getting a copyrighted work and using the copyrighted work and registering the copyrighted work are all very much easier to do for copyrights than it is for anything else. So it, it, it is a good idea if you can figure clever ways to use copyrighted works. For example, uh, a figure is a visual work of art. Now, we know under copyright law that this figure that's under, uh, that it's a work of art, uh, will last 70 years plus lives and being. Well, that, that's good, but what happens when it runs out? What happens to Mickey Mouse? Um, we now have to go back to the trademark, and we can basically run a parallel course with trademarks that we are running with copyright. So we have the copyright protected for 70 years, but as I said initially, the trademark rights can last in perpetuity as long as you keep renewing them. So you can use one kind of intellectual property to get yourself into a position where you can use a different but a longer time of, of uh, perpetuity, long, much longer um, than you could with uh, copyright. So you do copyright, get your, get your trademark rights, then start doing trademark rights as well, uh, renewing when you can either case but knowing that the trademark will let you renew for a long period of time. Okay, so now we come to derivative works, which is an, a, a tough concept. A derivative work is a work based upon one or more pre-existing works, such as a translation, musical arrangement, dramatization, motion picture, art reproduction, or any other form in which the work may be recast, transformed, or adapted. It could include a dictionary. It can include the white pages. Can't have that. We already know there's not enough work of an author there. And for the derivative work, the derivative work as a whole has to be copyrightable in order, in order for it to continue. Okay. So let's take a little more look at derivative works. Your copyright as a derivative work as a derivative work extends only to the material you added. So you can't take your 10,000 word program and create a derivative work from it and then think that you've automatically gotten the 10,000 word program and the derivative work together as uh, the material. And it's just the opposite. You don't have the material work except the derivative work that extends to the material you added. 
your edition must be different enough for the original or obtain a substantial amount of new material. So you had two chapters in your book before. Now you have three chapters in your book. A lot of new material. But if the third chapter was copied from somebody else's book, it wouldn't do you much good. Um, the derivative work also does not affect the copyright for the underlying work. So just because I have a derivative work doesn't mean uh, that I cancel the original work. The original work still stands by itself. The Lee, in the Lee case, he you know something about about uh, keeping all of your your uh, decisions together. Anyhow, the Lee case, a store owner cut up a greeting card and mounted it on a coaster, cute idea, but not a cop, not a derivative work because there was no original contribution. All he still had was the cup and the greeting card. The greeting card might be mixed up a little bit, but it was still a greeting card. It's still the same greeting card. So it's not a derivative work because there was no original contribution protected by um, what's called the first sales doc. And the first sale doctrine, one second, the first sale doctrine says you can do what you want with the lawfully obtained copy of a work. So you can resell a book, you can resell a CD. You got them initially, you bought the work, you have the right under the first sale doctrine to be able to sell that work. That particular one, you don't have a right to copy. You don't have a right to, to, to perform things that would otherwise be an infringement of a copyrighted work. But you do have the right to take your copy of your book and sell it to, for example, a used bookstore. That brings us to fair use. Okay, there are four factors used to determine if something is fair use. The purpose and character of the use. Was it commercial? You, you, you played the Beatles music and let everybody copy it? Not good. So purpose and character of the use, commercial versus educational nonprofit. You analyze a book to understand its theme. That's okay. It's a fair use. You can do a lot of quoting from the book. It'll be jumbled up from the way the book had it. But you can use it. You can do that. The amount of the copyrighted work used. If you're going to use over 20, 25%, you better start looking over your shoulder for somebody who's going to be talking about copyright infringement. Because you basically, effectively, taken a good portion of the book. The effect of the use of the, on the market for the original work. In essence, what, what you're saying is if you have a book by an author named Rashi and uh, you wanted to, to copy his work, and so you put on a copy of the work, but you used different formatting, um, you would still be guilty of copyright infringement because you're depriving the owner of substantially the entire use of the copyrighted work in the marketplace. Some examples of uses that are fair uses. Quotes, excerpts used in a review. That could be any kind of review. Parody, reproduction of a work a part of a work by a teacher or student for use in a lesson. Incidental reproduction, artwork in the background on a news report. You didn't mean and weren't trying to exploit that, but it happened anyhow. Okay, which brings us to what happens when you have a copyrighted work. 
you got to think again about licensing, finding some way to use your your want, your desire, and need uh, to to make uh, the work of an author uh, your work. So. The first thing to do is to make sure that you get a hold of the author. The Library of Congress will help you do that, mm -hmm. and you try to get the copyrighted work. So you try the Copyright Office website in order to, to find out where the where the work is. Um, you draft a licensing ex agreement. You can you can do on. But I mean, it's pretty sophisticated stuff, and usually you don't. You have other people draft a licensing agreement explaining how you will use their work. So you prepare a proposal uh, for licensing. The um, I'm sorry, I'm distracted for a minute. Wesley Brodsky, is there a problem with... I'm sorry, uh, we'll talk later. Uh, sorry. Anyhow, each individual work right in, in a bundle of rights may be granted individually. So I can have a license, and you remember we had several different kinds of licenses, uh, uh, several different kinds of works. For each one of those works, you have um, the right to reproduce, the right to make derivative works, the right to distribute copies, the right to publicly display, the right to publicly perform, the right to perform via digital audio transmission. Each one of those can be separately licensed. You need to make sure, do you need the whole license? What if the guy is selling the work, the chapters, individually? And so you're our, our sequels, prequels. Uh, you are then, uh, you may not need any of the rights to reproduce. You may just buy them from him and resell them. So the license becomes valuable, um, especially if you can pick and choose what parts you want and you know where what kind of business you're in in order to take care of it. That brings us almost to closing. Um, we have orphan works in the closing. An orphan work is a work that nobody knows where the author is. There's no way to get an okay, to get a license. You can make a serious good faith effort to locate the owner um, You can, as I said, you can try the Copyright Office uh, website. You can draft a licensing agreement. But sometimes you, whatever you do doesn't work for you. Nothing works po positively. And so you have the orphan work, which would limit damages. This is a, a bill standing before Congress from year to year, and, and Congress in their divine wisdom has decided not to pass the bill yet, at least. And so um, in 2008, which was the last time it came up, um, who knows what will happen. But so far, nobody has said, okay, we want these orphan works reproduced. We don't want the distributors to be at risk in reproducing the work. And so we'll go forward. Congress and limit the amount of damages if you truly have an orphan work and then later someday somebody's able to prove who that work is. For example, Shakespeare. Okay. Now what about the, the more interesting but expensive case of infringement? What do you need as, as important objects? for infringement. You have to register your work. Remember we talked about registration, about filing a form. 
it's actually already on and you do it online with the Copyright Office of the Library of Congress. Remember, www. Okay, you must have registered your work to bring an infringement claim. You must then show two things for infringement, access to the work and substantial similarity. The access says I had the ability to find the work and copy it, and then the similarity says, and when I look over this work, it sure looks an awful lot like that other work. Okay, if you can prove your case, you can choose actual or statutory damages. Remember, we talked about statutory damages and actual damages a few minutes ago. Actual, prove the amount of use and could be compensated for what you have received. Statutory does not require any proof of actual damages. All it does is you convince a judge how much you should be awarded. So statutory damages, what are you talking about money-wise? The normal statutory damages will run you anywhere between $750 to $30,000 per infringement. Now, if the infringement was willful, damages may be increased to $150,000 from even $30,000. If the infringer can show he did not know he was infringing and no reason to know, uh, can, you can have the damages reduced to $200. And then reasonable reliance on fair use can reduce damages. Remember, fair use was your right to use, for example, for parity. Now, what are the... Re what are the registration requirements for infringement? And these are precautionary things. These are things that you want to do whenever you're trying to protect a copyrighted work. For example, you've got a new maintenance manual out. You probably want to have a copyrighted work. And to do that, you have to register. It's a necessity to register to protect yourself. So, to recover from infringement, you must have registered prior to the infringement and within that. Prior to the infringement means if you want to keep statutory damages and within three months of publication, someone else's infringing use of your work does not constitute publication. So, you still would have your right to, to get um, statutory damages. Um, these little headings, it, it, I don't want them to mislead you. You can have a registered work, and um, you, can, you can lose some of your registration rights. For example, statutory damages. But the thing you, you still have is a right for injunctive relief. Keep other people from continuing to copy your work. For that, you need... Um, uh, a work um, that you can uh, keep to yourself even though you don't have any right to statutory damages. It may be that the work is important enough uh, to make it uh, valuable even though you don't ever distribute a copy of it. Okay, now we have recovering for infringement. This is the do-it-yourself because there was no way to explain this in any reasonable period of time. You can draft what's called a cease and desist letter. It's a letter that says, uh, if I'm writing it, this letter says my client has informed me that you're feeling bad guy, yeah, copying such and such work, reproducing such and such work, um, and uh, you have a period of time, 10 days, to either stop that or the client will take whatever action is appropriate. So that's a cease and desist letter. If you use it online, send a takedown notice to the owner of the site displaying the work. 
send letters via certified mail, and keep copies. If there are no response or settlement, you may have to file a lawsuit. And as a comfort to you, most lawsuits settle. Of course, if the other side is using lawyers and you're trying to do it yourself, I don't recommend that. Okay, so we've basically covered the various intellectual property rights that are available to you. Uh, in detail, we covered copyright rights. Other intellectual property right protection includes trademarks or service marks. Trademarks protect the name of the product, Coca-Cola. Service marks protect um, the services rendered. Uh, you're, you're going to do some sort of uh, service and maintenance, and you have a maintenance word that's important uh, and helps people recognize you. That's a trademark. Patent protects inventions or processes, but only the work itself, not the idea. Well, they, they protect the idea of the work. I'm sorry. And then uh, trade dress which is uh, the look and feel of the business or product, uh, a, a restaurant with a, a particular look to it would be that. Trademarks are available both federally and in the state of Texas, which is where I am, and in virtually every other state in the United States. They're, as federal, it costs 275 for a trademark class, they last as long as you continue to use the mark. Once you get it registered, if you don't get it registered, and there are reasons why for which you have to listen to my previous program on trademarks, um, you need to register them every 10 years and show continuous use during the 10 years. Now, you've got um, $50 per trademark in Texas and protects the use of your business name or logo in commerce, and a brand name may be protected. I'm going to stop here and see. I think I got some questions. I don't know if people are still here. Let me see if I can move my screen a little bit, see what you asked. Okay, first question was from Margo. No, that's her name, giving her name. Dave, there's one uh, question. Are logos included in a copyright or is, is it just a trademark? Logos may be included in copyrights if they're a work of an author. They have more, have some amount of creative value. And so uh, you can also use them for trademarks. So you can use it for both. Okay. The next question is, does fixed intangible medium include, for example, a PLC program? Yes. Uh, this type copyright. Oh, that's a response to someone else, I guess. And uh, the next question is, if two people together write one piece of music without words, uh, yes, I that's a it, joint work. Okay. If you have more questions, please type them in the chat pod, and uh, Dave will respond to them. Okay, we have one here about two. Oh, that's a, you already asked me that question. Okay, Mark, uh, there's another question. Can we protect a brainstorming idea, brainstorming ideas among uh, potential partners of a startup? Remember, copyrights don't protect ideas. They protect the expression of the idea. So you're probably looking at patent rights rather than trademark, uh, rather than copyright rights. Anybody else? Okay, I think another question is coming. One second.
Uh, the next question is, are user interface designs copyrightable or patentable? They're utilitarian in nature. Um, and I'm presuming that interface design is, is human engineering. That's what you're talking about. If not, correct me. But you're saying interface designs, uh, especially slick ones, uh, would almost always be patents and not copyrights. The software might be copyrightable. Okay. And the next and question can, is? Let me wait, wait, one question. The, the software may be copyrightable. Um, and therefore, you could have a joint thing. You could have a patent on the overall device, and you could have a copyright on the software and simultaneously. Okay. okay. The next question, is a business plan copyrightable? Um, it would depend on how you express it. Uh, for example, if, if all you do is you have a little form that people fill out, that would not be copyrightable. Okay. Uh, for example, in a computer program or mobile phone application interface. Yeah, that's is probably that copyrightable. Be, that's a follow-on from the previous question okay. about user interface designs. And Dave, what was the Digital Copyright Act you mentioned before the lecture? DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And I mentioned that in terms of protection um, of copyrighted works that are encrypted. Okay. Well, um, user if, interface. Uh, Wait, I get one more here from Joe Mole. Well, maybe two more. Is that okay, okay. if I hand them? We still on the yeah, time? Yes, go ahead. Um, works that I created a decade ago are now showing up on the web. Oop. I did not register them at the time. Can I legally get them removed now? Uh, it never hurts because it doesn't cost very much to file, get a copyright right, and then test the water. I need to know more information in order to really help you with with what you're struggling with. I'm, for example, um, you wrote them a decade ago, and they were published a decade ago, and so they've been in the domain for 10 years, and not only that, but more than three years ago, they started showing up on the Internet. That probably would not be protectable. Okay. And, and the next you question might is... Get, and, and, and you're not going to get statutory damages in any event. Unless you're in the business, you're going to have trouble with actual damages. So you may end up having an injunction, and you ought to be fairly comfortably wealthy for that. Okay, the next question is, can I use my ideas that I developed while employed to create a business now that I'm unemployed? You, I'm being very careful because you asked me, can I use my ideas? Now, remember, copyright rights aren't protectable. Uh, can I protect ideas? So... We're talking probably trade secrets. And the question is, you need to get out your employment agreement, but in all likelihood, um, those are limited in time, and you probably can use those ideas because they no longer have a right to sue. But it, that needs to be looked over very carefully by a lawyer. Okay, uh, that's... We're about to all of the call. questions, that's all of the questions we have. I want to give Dave a big thank you, and uh, 
On behalf of IEEE USA, I want to thank the participants. Okay, I think. I'm going to end the webinar now. Okay. Thank you.